Part two of Schubert and His Work by Herbert F. Pazer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two The Earliest Compositions and the Early Symphonies. Let us look back briefly to consider a few of Schubert's early creative accomplishments. How many experimental efforts preceded his earliest extant compositions we can only surmise his first surviving one is a forehand piano fantasy thirty-two pages long running to more than a dozen movements with frequent changes of time and key a little later on march thirty eighteen eleven he began his first vocal composition an immensely prolix affair called hagar's klage to a discursive poem about hagar lamenting her dying child in the desert with its varying rhythms its pathetic slow introduction its elaborate allegro and its passionate prayer it shows the influence of the popular german ballad master johann rudolf zumstieg who had himself composed the same text not only zumstieg but composers like reichardt and goethe's friend zelter exercised moulding influence on schubert in his formative stage a setting of schiller's leichten fantasie is carried out on much the same lines and so is a ballad der vatermurder to a text by pfeffel and there were other things besides long trailing ballads an orchestral overture in d a so-called quartet overture and quintet overture an andante and a set of variations for piano three string quartets in changing keys schubert wrote seven quartets in all during his convict days thirty minuets with trio for strings german dances some four-part kyries for the lichtental church and other matters bearing the dates eighteen eleven and eighteen twelve the good rusica finding himself unable to teach his young charge anything he did not know already handed him over to salieri who began to give him lessons in counterpoint on june eighteen eighteen twelve schubert made a record of the date he must have profited by salieri's instruction or he would hardly have remained his pupil all of five years as he did one circumstance may astonish us that he briefly suffered himself to be swayed by the prejudice salieri harbored against beethoven yet when salieri celebrated his fiftieth year of musical activities in eighteen sixteen schubert made a slighting entry in his diary about certain bizarreries of modern tendencies that this could have been only a passing aberration is clear from the fact that beethoven remained his divinity and his despair to his dying day he once told his friend spahn there are times when i think something could come of me but who is capable of anything after beethoven indeed beethoven remained to such a degree an obsession of his that the older master's name was almost the last word he ever uttered Franz Theodor found it inexpedient to remain long a widower. Less than a year after the loss of the quiet woman who had been his deeply treasured wife, he married the daughter of a silk goods manufacturer, the Wertsgeschäfte Jungfrau Anna Kleienburg, a woman of thirty, twenty years his junior. The entire Schubert family, including the black sheep from the convict, was present at the wedding on April 25, 1813. Five more children were born, and this time only one died. Anna Kleienbrück fitted perfectly into the Schubert menage. Contrary to the tradition of stepmothers, she idolized her stepson Franz, and was no less adored by him in return later when father schubert's pecuniary position somewhat improved anna showed herself a model of economy and thrift always putting what occasional savings the schoolmaster gave her into a woolen stocking it was from this stocking that she more than once furnished a helping mite to her stepson in his days of need franz's voice changed in eighteen twelve and logically his days at the convict should have been numbered but the authorities were by no means anxious to be rid of him and his father would probably have been pleased if he had stayed on 
even the emperor to whom representations were made and whose attention the boy's talents seemed to have attracted agreed that he might remain and take advantage of the Merfold scholarship provided he made an effort to improve his standing in mathematics franz himself must have realized that to return home meant to court renewed trouble with his father not to mention the risk of actual starvation yet he was so fed up on the convict that about the end of october eighteen thirteen he left what he called the prison his last work written there it is dated october twenty eighth eighteen thirteen was his first symphony but he maintained cordial relations with the seminary for some years tried out some of his new compositions in the convict music-room and preserved his interest in the school orchestra the early symphonies this is perhaps as good a place as any to consider for a moment the early symphonies of schubert one says early because schubert's symphonic output falls sharply into two distinct halves six of them two in d major two in b flat one in c minor and one in c major belong to the years from eighteen thirteen through eighteen seventeen they are relatively small in scale melodically charming in numerous detail of harmony and colour unmistakably schubertian yet by and large derivative they naively reflect phraseology and other influences the young composer assimilated from the music he was then studying and hearing thus in the second symphony may be heard echoes of beethoven's fourth and jostling one another through the pages of the others are reminiscences if not outright citations of haydn mozart beethoven rossini weber the fourth in c minor is for some not clearly defined reason entitled tragic the sixth still more inexplicably the composer characterized as grosse great symphony in c perversely enough it is probably the weakest of the six the one which least satisfied its creator time has paradoxically rechristened this symphony the little c major to distinguish it from the great c major of eighteen twenty eight the fifth in b flat remains with its endearing reminders of mozart perhaps the loveliest and most frequently played of all his symphonic juvenilia most of these scores however are oftener heard to-day than they were till recent years for all their perhaps half-conscious borrowings they are still palpable schubert even if lesser schubert such a master as dvorak was always ready to break a lance in their behalf and one of his proudest boasts was how often as conservatory director in new york he used to conduct his students orchestra in the fifth of the set no sooner was schubert liberated from the convict than he found himself faced with a worse menace conscription service in the austrian army was in those days no laughing matter its duration was fourteen years and the prospect of such a lifetime of soldiering might have appalled an even less sensitive nature than schubert's there were loopholes of course particularly for those who had wealth and position for those who did not the best road of escape lay through the schoolroom since there was need of teachers the government exempted them it almost looked as if the state were conspiring with father schubert against his son poor franz peter had no alternative and so barely out of the convict he enrolled in the normal school of st anna for a ten months preparatory course to teach a primary class at his father's school a chore which was to occupy him for the next three years hateful as he found his labours he seems to have discharged them conscientiously enough yet if the convict where he had numerous friends was a prison what was this he was only one of many assistants and he had to live under his father's roof though he did earn forty gulden a year was he a good disciplinarian he himself once confessed to his friends franz lochner that he was a quick-tempered teacher who when disturbed by the little imps in his class while he composed thrashed them soundly because they always made him lose the thread of his thought 
his sister theresa later told kreisel von helborn schubert's first biographer that he kept his finger in practice on the children's ears another story has it that he was finally dismissed for a particularly smart box on the ear of a particularly stupid girl still when schubert later applied for another school position superintendent joseph spendu commended the applicant's a method of handling the young while he was at the st anna school schubert composed among a quantity of other things his first complete mass and his first opera the former in f is the more important of the two it was written for the limited resources of the lichtental parish church which on october fourteen eighteen fourteen celebrated its centenary in mind the work of the seventeen-year-old composer was heard with unconcealed pleasure he conducted it himself his former teacher holzer led the choir and the soprano soloist was theresa grob a year younger than schubert and daughter of a lichtental merchant who lived around the corner from father schubert's schoolhouse ten days later the mass was repeated in the church of st augustine in the imperial hofburg this performance seems to have aroused even more enthusiasm and good will than the first salieri proudly pointed to the boyish composer as his own pupil and franz theodor now that he knew his son safely caged in a classroom made him a present of a five octave piano the mass itself a tenderly felt lyrical simple work is sensitive and promising rather than something epoch-making such as the composer was soon to achieve in the less pretentious province of the solo song a word about theresa grope who more or less properly figures in schubert's story as his first love her family was refined and musical and franz peter who was a visitor in the grope household may have found there some of the same sympathy and understanding the young beethoven did in the home of the von brunings certainly he composed a number of things for theresa and her brother heinrich his friends holzapfel declares that theresa was no beauty but shapely rather plump with a fresh round little face of a child in after years schubert told anselm hüttenbrunner that he had loved her very deeply she was not pretty he said and was pockmarked but good to the heart he had hoped to marry her but could find no position which would ensure him the means to support a wife her mother having decided it was no use to wait for a penniless composer to become a somebody made her take a well-to-do baker instead poor schubert told his friend this had greatly pained him and that he loved her still but added philosophically as a matter of fact she was not destined for me did schubert we may ask really contemplate marriage if he did how are we to understand an entry he made in his diary in eighteen sixteen marriage is a terrifying thought to a free man actually schubert's life was devoid of what might be described as urgent affairs of the heart outwardly at least one will seek vainly in his case for the periodic transports of a beethoven or even the passing dalliances of a mozart friendships rather than passionate ardors were schubert's specialties and his friendships with women were quite as sincere as with men and had the same basis of sentimental conviviality hüttenbrenner had small reason to chaff his companion as he once did for being so cold and dry in society toward the fair sex certainly the delightful frelich sisters whom we shall meet shortly did not find him dry it is so easy to mistake shyness for coldness and if schubert was anything he was diffident sometimes tragically so opera had exercised a strong attraction on franz peter even while he was a student at the convict he used to accompany spahn to the kärtner tor theater whenever holidays or the state of spahn's purse permitted the friends sat in the top gallery and heard operas like weigel's schweitzer familia spontini's vestal cherubini's medea boidieu's jean de paris and gluck's iphigenia in paris among the great singers schubert heard in this way were pauline milder and johann michael vogel 
both artists were soon to become his friends vogel indeed the high priest of his songs what wonder then that schubert planned an opera of his own in may eighteen fourteen while at the st anna school he completed a natural magic opera in three acts he called des teufels lustschloss the devil's pleasure palace the libretto was by a popular dramatist of the time august kurzbühu who could hardly have attached much importance to it or he would never have permitted an unknown beginner to compose it the piece was the first of a pageant of ugly ducklings an operatic progeny of sorrow destined to span schubert's life from his school days to his grave if we add up his works for the stage completed fragmentary partly sketched or lost in less than a decade and a half we shall arrive at the astonishing total of eighteen and to-day there is almost nothing to show for all this heartbreaking industry because an ancient and largely untested tradition calls schubert's operas undramatic and otherwise poor theatre possibly they are but how many now living can speak of a schubert opera from actual experience des teufels lustschloss was never performed in schubert's vienna though prague was once on the point of staging it the plot has to do with the adventures of an impecunious count oswald who on the way to his tumbled-down castle with his wife stops at a wayside inn there the peasantry of the neighbourhood entreats the knight to free a nearby ruin from ghosts and other spooky visitants he consents and together with his squire a kind of sancho panza penetrates the infested premises the spectres take him captive and subject him to grisly tests the worst of which is a command to marry a ghostly but extremely substantial amazon who suddenly appears on the scene in despair oswald springs into the abyss and lands in the arms of his wife her wealthy uncle it transpires being displeased with his niece's marriage to the penniless count has arranged the whole ordeal as a test of oswald's fidelity with the help of his gardener's buxom daughter the amazon and machines of all kinds brought at considerable expense from foreign parts it should be remembered however that such extravagances were habitual ingredients of innumerable magic plays and comedies which for generations indeed for centuries formed the stock and trade of the viennese suburban theatre and the most sublimated outgrowth of which was mozart's magic flute moreover not the effect of such a wild tale in the reading but in performance on the stage in a theatre before an audience is the proof of the pudding the same with the text a specimen of the poetry of des teufels lustlos is the ensuing of count oswald's squire i'm laughing i'm crying i'm crying i'm laughing i'm laughing ha 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 i'm laughing he 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 i'm laughing ho 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 i'm laughing hoo 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 the test of such a thing is not the verbiage but the composer's treatment of it there is no question here of a masterpiece any more than there is in the mass or indeed in the various orchestral or chamber works he had produced thus far it was different however with the song lead which he was turning out in effortless abundance he had made settings among other things of poems by schiller Fouque, Matheson, Adelaide for one, though smoother, more lyrical, and less varied in its mood than Beethoven's famous song. Then, on October 19, 1814, the birthday of the German lead, it has been called, there comes, like a bolt from the blue, the epoch-making Gretchen am Spinrade from Goethe's Faust it is a simple plaintive melody above a murmuring spinning-wheel figure and a pulsing rhythmic throb but nevertheless a marvel of jointless form and a miracle of psychology the emotional experience of ages concentrated into one hundred bars of music of such infinite art and uncanny perfection that it almost defies analysis as if a gigantic dam had burst a torrent of immortal master-songs now begins to pour forth 
not everything to be sure either now or later is a deathless creation but the number of those that are will probably remain baffling to the end of time schubert frequently made two three or more settings of one and the same text differing in greater or lesser degree from the earlier one though not invariably better than the preceding version of the more than six hundred leaders schubert composed almost a third are such resettings it was nothing unusual for him to turn out four five six songs a day when i finish one i begin another was his carefree way of describing the incredible process sometimes he even forgot which songs were his own i say that's not a bad one who wrote it he once asked on hearing something he had composed only a few days before he was careless too about what became of some of his manuscripts and there is no telling how much posterity may have lost as a result once he came near ruining a page on which he had written his song di farella by pouring ink instead of sand over the wet writing being sleepy he did not bother to notice which receptacle he had picked up End of part two.